So there's some do's and don'ts. Please reach out to people who can help. The EAP number, website's on there, right? We, we have that. Provide information, educational materials. If on-site services like this, do these kind of things, right? Talk about them. Identify and involve family contact early if appropriate. In that suicidal situation in that workplace I was talking about, that was really a hard thing because the family, can you imagine, family's in shock too. They at first didn't want anybody to talk about it. Psychologically, that's hard when they're saying to the workplace, sorry, you can't talk about his, the cause of death. You can't talk about that because they were struggling, so they were holding that in. And then it leaked out, just like workplace gossip, right? It leaks out because we all don't want to feel alone. How do you hold that in? Right? And then management initially got angry for people for leaking it. What are you leaking that for? The family said no. Well, they leaked it because they want to feel better. They're struggling with it. Psychologically, we know it helps to have the facts of things to heal. It just does. Right? And so that, but it's important though to identify and involve family contact early so you can help them understand, help them heal. Help them know to give permission to the workplace to be able to do that too. You see what I mean? It's an important stuff. Some other do's, manage the information as an organization, be clear, be consistent. You know, and if you don't already have a policy on things like grief and loss, especially unexpected loss like suicide, it would be important <coughs> to be ready if it does. What do you do? What do you do as an organization if that happens? And think about somebody's workspace, right? What do you do with that? How do you keep honoring that? How long? What do you, how do you manage that? Do you bring family in to get their stuff? Do you pack it yourself? What do you do, right? It's a really tough question. It's important to talk about it. And sometimes it's important to set up a memorial service at work. You know? I had the opportunity to do a secular memorial service for a CEO of a company. He called me in to set this up before he died. <laughs> he was dying, terminal cancer. And he called and said, here, Randy, here's what I can, this is what I, and this is really different for me. Even talking about it now, I'm thinking, wow, that was strange, but kind of, I was honored. So they, they wanted to, he was honoring his memory, so we set that up. And he asked me to do something like uh, the Tim McGraw song, Live Life Like You're Dying, right? That's what his thing was, what, for whatever that's what, you know, that's what he wanted. That was important to him, so we did. So again, that stuff, whatever, you know, that, that's important to think about that. Set up commemorative objects, something that reminds people, because it's, it's important to remember. And it's also important to think about anniversaries of significant things, too help people with that. Okay. Some don'ts, don't be, don't be surprised by the range of feelings. Don't forget business continuity and don't participate in gossip in person or on social media. Oftentimes, remember I said we do want to talk, you got to figure that out and manage that because we say a lot of wrong things. I responded to an officer involved shooting in Madison three, four weeks ago. And what was interesting is somebody got it wrong and, and, and thought that one of the police officers was shot fatally. And they put that all over the news. Can you imagine the spouses and the significant others of those police officers? They were wondering, wow, was it my loved one who was, and it was wrong. It was wrong, it didn't happen. It's not what happened. But people, you know, they sometimes when they don't have all the information, they fill in the gaps with wrong information. So it's important not to do that. So like I said, suicide, homicide, challenges our basic beliefs, human on human kinds of crime, right? And suicide, if it, I'm sure you know, is investigated as a crime initially. It is. So again, it's contrary to survival instincts because we all know you can't work out anything dead. We have to be alive to work things out. And that's, that's, that's what makes it hard, and that's that why question. And again, 
it makes things, I'll give you an example, just recently, it was a part of a situation where uh, a father uh, ended up taking his life in such a way that his family found him, two young children, and his wife found him. He was angry, and look, can you imagine, these were pre-adolescent children. Talk about adverse childhood experiences, right? They got them right there. What do you do with that information? You see, it increases the problem, right? So it's gonna be important to help them. And their kind of grief is going to be far different in some ways, you know. So again, what about your people that are out and about? You have people that go into the communities. I know that I've debriefed some kinds of situations here where people have felt like their life was in danger, right? Those kind of things are important to understand that um, uh, uh, People who aren't here every day or you don't see them every day, they, they need support too. Think about that. And also, professions that you deal with threat to life, right? Because it might not be your own personal, but you're around that. You're around it. That can be grief and loss issues too. Remember that, right? So, Again, providing support to those you care about, which fits into one of your values. Trust us to always treat you with empathy and respect, right? So understand that grief is, don't judge somebody's style. However they grieve is that. And in fact, maybe if they don't even want to talk about it or grieve, that's their problem, right? Be sensitive, compassionate, and acknowledging. Hold space. That's holding space for another. Even if that space is keeping somebody in your thoughts and prayers, they don't even have to know you're doing that. Right? You're doing that. There's power in that. We know that there's power in that. Offer practical support, including specific things you could do, <coughs> like meals and they can freeze, right? They can eat or they need their <coughs> pets at home that could use walking. I don't know. Ask. Maybe they have children that they could use a little respite from. I'm not sure, but what some practical things. Maybe at work, take temporarily take some of their duties off of them, right? Whatever that might be. Encourage that person to take care of him or herself. Always talk about self-care, right? Always talk about that. You know, whatever that might mean. You know, asking them, what are you doing? How are you doing that? And, you know, and that might risk them getting angry. But let me tell you something about that. The worst thing you could do is nothing, right? So if somebody gets a little bit angry or a lot of angry at you, they just mobilized their feelings and they got unstuck. We might not like that, but they got unstuck. We used to use that as a therapeutic process in a psychiatric day treatment center I worked at. We would have a protagonist and an antagonist, right? And we would do things to, to help mobilize somebody therapeutically to be angry, like giving them a toothbrush to clean the whole floor. <laughs> I laugh about that, <laughs> but that's kind of, and then and one of us would say, boy, that's a bad job you're doing. You better get busy and do it worse. And then, because you have some people who can't get to their feelings, right? And, and, and so again, realizing that anger is a basic human emotion. And remember, <laughs> anger is a stage of grief too, right? So understand that that kind of stuff, take that risk. Be a good listener if the individual wishes to talk, you know? You don't have to have the right words. You know, and I, I, the biggest story for me that I remember is when one of my good friends, he was a doctor up in the Marshfield Clinic, nephrologist, his, his wife was someone I grew up with in Pennsylvania. She, uh, she was a nutritionist, a dietitian. She ate better than anybody ever knew, right? Good foods. Because her mom died at age 38 of cancer. So she was going to say, I'm not going to have that happen to me. Do you know what happened to her when she turned 38? Diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. 
It's an insidious disease. So, you know, we, we, we think about that. And, and she had access to the best medical treatment around with her husband, so she did. She worked hard at it. Because she had children the same age as my wife and I. And at that time, they were like five and three. And, and they lived for seven years. You know, she was fighting it, and one after one really tough treatment um, regime, she was home in a hospital bed. And her whole thing was, she would say, I want to live long enough that my children know their mother. I want to live long enough that my children know their mother. So she worked hard at that. And then when her oldest was 12 in that hospital bed at home, he came over, took her hand and said, Mom, because she was suffering with so much pain, Mom, I, I just want you to know I, I know you. I, I know you. And the next day she passed, right? And so I remember when the memorial service was set up, her husband's name's Brian, and I was going up to see Brian. And on my way up to Marshfield, I was thinking, what am I going to say? What words am I going to say? You know, I do this for a living, but I don't know what to say. So I thought, well, I'm going to call my EAP. So I called my EAP on the way, and, and they said, Randy, you know, you know, you don't need to say anything. Just go. So I went. Knocked on the door of the house. I opened the door. There was Brian. Well, I didn't know. I'm looking at him. I'm just looking at him. And then all of a sudden, I just held out my hands. And for the first time, him and I hugged. We were tough guys that just shut and took our hand. So we hugged. And I didn't say a thing, right? And some, you know, I guess so that's the thing to think about. You don't need to find, because sometimes words just don't do justice to what's important, right? Next one. So again, one. Another one of your values is listening with purpose. Listening with purpose, right? Listening with purpose. And what better purpose than to listen to somebody who's lost somebody important in their life? That's purpose, right? And, you know, empathy is really seeing it through a person's eyes, have the willingness to be involved, take time to learn about the person, the other person, and the person they lost. Ask. Hands, right? Let them teach you how to help them. Ask them, what can I do? And even if they don't know, always stay with it. Stay persistent in a patient, thoughtful, respectful way. And continuously, what we can always do to be ready is to improve our ability to connect and understand others. Improve your emotional intelligence. So you can stop and subordinate your own internal stuff and your own ego sometimes so you can actually listen to others who are hurting around you. A lot of people have a hard time talking about it. So can you hear what somebody can't say? You hear that, right? You're that kind of person where you can sense those things. And that's real, real important. And that and we can grow that until we pass away. We can grow our emotional intelligence at any time. We can become better people in that way.